Welcome, everyone. I'm Fran Hagopian. I teach in the government department at Harvard, and I'm also faculty co-chair of our Brazil Studies program. And it's my great honor and an even greater uh, pleasure today to introduce um, uh, our session for you today. This is going to be a fantastic session. I've been looking forward to it for weeks now. Um, our session will be anchored by first. Let me um, first say. Um, something about how we'll run the session before I introduce our panelists. Um, we um, want to hear from all of you, but we disabled the chat for you. So what we would like is for you to ask questions using the question and answer function on your Zoom um, uh, menu. And we will monitor the question and answers and um, I will ask your questions on your behalf. Um, we will start with our presentation from our speaker, Alice Shu, and we will be followed by our two discussants. Let me introduce this distinguished panel to you. Alice is a PhD student in the Harvard government department. She did her undergraduate work at Columbia University and she was a visiting student while an undergraduate in the famous PPE program at Oxford University. At Harvard, she studies really important questions of our time, not of 20 or 30 years ago. She studies the political economy of inequality and the welfare state. She studies urban politics. She studies environmental politics. And she's got great geographic range. She's done work both in East Africa as well as in Latin America and especially in Brazil. For me personally, this is a great moment. Alice came to my class in Brazilian politics many years ago, and she has completely thrown herself into the study of Brazil. She has spent probably a total of about 18 months doing field work. Um, a lot of it in Sao Paulo, but also in four other cities in Brazil. Um, and Alice is um, someone who has, she has done everything right. She has not taken the easy way out. She has generated an amazing amount of original data about the subject she'll speak to us about today. And that is the distribution of public goods and how the spatial pattern of how people live affects their preferences for the public and private provision of public goods. This is cutting edge, amazing research, and we're delighted that she will be joining us. We also have two amazing discussants. Um, when we thought of our wish list of who we could have, these are the two names we came up with, and to our delight, both Danny Hidalgo and Jonathan Phillips accepted our invitations. Danny is my colleague down the street in Cambridge. He is um, the Ida uh, and Cecil Green Associate Professor of Political Science at MIT. He is a Berkeley PhD. He did his undergraduate work at Princeton. He's gotten, he has a long list of grants and publications in the very top journals in our discipline. He is someone who has both substantive interests and methodological expertise, sort of like Alice, which is what makes him such a great discussant for this. He, his research focuses on the political economy of elections, campaigns, and representation in developing democracies, especially in Latin America. He's done amazing work in Brazil, and he's published, as I said, in every top journal in our discipline. He is a great discussant, as is our other discussant, Jonathan Phillips, who, like Alice, um, did his PhD at Harvard, despite the fact that his latches says um, that he was, he took his PhD in political science at the University of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is actually, the University of Sao Paulo is actually where he teaches now as a professor doctor, um, or we would know in the United States as an assistant professor. Jonathan also has research um, experience both in Africa, especially Nigeria and Brazil, also in India. His research is broad ranging. He's always concerned with governance in developing countries. 
and in, like Alice in the equal distribution of, of um, public goods and of access to public services and in the kind of governance structures that make this possible. He did his undergraduate work in that same program of PPE at Oxford. He did his master's at the School of Oriental and African Studies um, and his PhD at Harvard. And as I said, he is now teaching at the University of Sao Paulo and deeply ensconced into every important center and working group that is working on these issues in Sao Paulo today. He's a member of the Centro de Estudos de Metrópole at USP. He's a researcher at CCSP at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. He is part of the committee that runs the methods workshop in January at USP. And he, like um, Danny, um, combines and teaches cutting edge methodological techniques with real substantive interest. So um, this panel will be so rich that I want to stop talking to let our panelists speak. But before I go, um, I want to not be remiss and in welcoming everyone here, I wanna give a special welcome to everyone joining us from Brazil today. Seja muito bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Alice, it's up to you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks, Fran, for that intro and um, for getting me as far as I am with this project. Um, thank you to everyone for being here, to Danny and to Johnny for reading and discussing the papers, and also to Chiago for coordinating this event. Um, as Fran mentioned, today I'll be presenting a core component of my dissertation project, a paper titled Segregation and the Spatial Externalities of Inequality, Public Goods and Polarization in Urban Brazil. And I want to start by telling you about two cities that are among the largest in Brazil. So on the left hand side is the city of Belo Horizonte, and on the right is that of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. They're both among the largest cities in Brazil. They both have comparable levels of fiscal capacity, and they both have equally high levels of uh, income inequality. The two cities are similar in many respects, except that as the capital of Brazil, we would expect that Brasilia has better access to resources from the federal government. Despite their similarities, they actually differ considerably in their provision of public goods and services. So for example, these figures map deficiencies in solid waste collection services in orange. So the darker the colors, the more their deficiencies. And it shows that while the city of Belo Horizonte on the left has almost complete coverage with a few exceptions, that of Brasilia, the capital Brazil has major deficiencies in coverage, especially in this outer ring of the city here. So I'm focused on the question of what explains this difference. And overall across Brazil's over 1,400 cities, there is extensive variation in the provision of infrastructural public goods. I'm focused on the puzzle of why cities of comparable fiscal capacity and level of inequality have such different amounts of public goods. And I clarify that there are two components to this puzzle. So first from the bottom up, in a democratic setting such as Brazil, voters' preferences for public goods matter and affect actual provision. Second, from the top down, local political institutions also shape how preferences are aggregated, as well as politicians' incentives for responding to them. In the broader dissertation book project, I study both how preferences for public goods form in cities, as well as how preferences map on to actual provision across and within cities. This paper, however, is only a snapshot of the book project, and in it, I zoom in on the unit of aggregation that is the neighborhood to focus exclusively on understanding how preferences for public goods form. The existing literature on the distributive politics of local public goods offers racial or ethnic diversity as the primary explanation for deficient public goods. And the idea is that racial diversity precludes a unified voice for public goods, whereas racially homogenous societies can use their common culture, their shared language, customs, race, 
to overcome the collective action problem when making demands for public goods. This racial diversity thesis is considered to be one of the most powerful hypotheses in political economy. And in addition, there is now a growing literature building on this about how it's not just about diversity, but more so about racial segregation. For this project, I'm interested in the question of what about socioeconomic diversity or segregation instead? There are several existing studies on the effects of inequality and class-based segregation on public policies. And building on this literature, I argue that when the focus is instead on socioeconomic class, there um, is an additional mechanism to consider, namely the negative spatial externalities of inequality that spill over between different income groups in heterogeneous localities. So the idea is that income differences generates externalities because the lower quality of life among the have-nots may also affect the welfare of the haves. An externality, more formally, is a type of missing market of the unpriced effects of one agent's or group's activity on the welfare of another. And I focus on two specific forms of spatial externalities of inequality. So first, um, sewage contamination. So impoverished areas, the favelas or comunidades, such as uh, Hoxinha in Rio de Janeiro, um, in this image here, in Brazilian cities tend to be up on a hill. And for this reason, sewage runoff that flows from the impoverished living uphill often imposes an externality cost on residents living downstream, usually the middle class. Another example of a externality of an inequality is that of crime. So with a concentration of poverty, a concentration of public service deficiencies in slums, in developing cities, they become breeding grounds for organized crime. An example of a spatial externality of inequality would be violence from turf wars between rival criminal factions that spill over across the borders of slums to neighboring territories. I hope this is all clear, but please let me know um, if you have any questions. I'd be happy to clarify this concept further later on. So the core argument is that socioeconomic segregation in cities affects voters' preferences for public goods. And the theorized mechanism is that of the spatial externalities of inequality. Segregation affects voters' preferences because it shapes patterns in the spatial distribution of such externality effects. And to test this argument, I leverage a research design that combines a quasi-experimental strategy for segregation with original survey data on household preferences. The aerial shot here is one of Mexico City, and the one here is of Johannesburg, South Africa. And the shot in the middle is of the Brazilian city of Sao Paulo. And what they show is the segregation of the informal settlements. So the colonias proletarias in Mexico City the slum Maswawa in Johannesburg, and the Corchizos in the center of Sao Paulo, the segregation of these informal settlements from the more formalized city. So as you can see across developing cities, such forms of segregation of the poor is a common phenomenon. And in this talk, I hope to clearly demonstrate that the answer to the puzzle of why cities vary extensively in their provision of infrastructural public goods is their layout of segregation. More specifically, to give a quick preview of the results, I find that um, reduced segregation, in other words, more integration, induces the formation of middle-class preferences for public goods that address the spatial externalities of inequality. And I find that this is because integration increases both the psychological and actual incidence of crime and sewage contamination that spills over to the middle class from impoverished areas. Alternatively, integration reduces relative preferences for private household provision of services where possible. So for example, with the use of private security guards or personal firearms. And this increase in preferences for the public in place of the private results in this vote switching effect from right to left wing candidates in local elections for city, city level politics. Therefore, contra the prominent racial diversity thesis discussed earlier, socioeconomic diversity or integration is actually good for public goods. 
the contributions of the analysis are fourfold. So first, methodologically, it has always been difficult to study um, segregation because of a selection effect. The middle class may self-sort into more segregated or integrated neighborhoods by choice. Um, hence, the integrated middle class may be inherently more tolerant of the poor. So to address this, I propose an empirical strategy for causally estimating the effects of socioeconomic integration. Second, the project also makes a data contribution. So the extant literature largely focuses on public goods provision as an outcome. And this is because there's rather limited data on preferences for public goods specifically. This almost exclusive focus on provision as an outcome in the distributed politics literature is problematic because it conflates the demand side effects of voters' preferences for public goods with the supply side effects of institutions and politician strategies as discussed earlier. So I collect an original database of household preferences for public and private goods to test a voter demand driven theory for preference formation specifically. As for theoretical contributions, the analysis illustrates a theory of spillover effects between class groups and how this mechanism explains both the extensive variation in public goods across cities, as well as city level political polarization along class lines. And the research design demonstrates how this externalities mechanism is empirically distinct from alternative mechanisms that links segregation to the formation of preferences for public goods. To give just a bit of context about the study, although um, I'm guessing this is hardly necessary among this audience, Brazil is a highly racially diverse country, um, yet like most countries in the Latin American region, it is one in which income trumps race as the dominant sociopolitical cleavage. And for this talk today, I focus specifically on the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is the largest city in the Latin American region, as well as in the Western hemisphere with over 14 million residents. Sao Paulo has 456 census areas, which are essentially neighborhoods. And to observe the externalities of inequality, I study the formation and spatial segregation of slums, popularly known in Brazil as the favelas, comunidades, or corchizos, which are often within each neighborhood or um, census area in Sao Paulo. So to clarify, a favela is usually not a neighborhood in itself. The provision of public goods is quite decentralized in Brazil with the bulk of the responsibilities resting in the hands of the municipal mayor or state governor. And elections for these subnational executives are conducted through majoritarian rule, implying a median voter framework for thinking about voter preferences. Last, like most developing megacities, the middle class is the emergent median voter. So it's important to understand exactly how their preferences form in cities. So this project began with the observation that socioeconomic integration has this strong positive correlation with the public provision of policing and trash and sewage collection across cities in Brazil. And I really wanted to know why this is. So I first went to some of these cities to talk to the middle class and the poor to get a sense of how they think about these issues. And I'm going to first present some of um, these qualitative insights to show how I arrive at the specific hypotheses I test. So over the course of 17 months of field research, I collected different forms of um, qualitative evidence. But what I'll present today largely draws from focus groups with middle class neighborhood associations living in these different layouts of segregation. The image on the right here illustrates three hypothetical cities with different idealized layouts of segregation. So city A is characterized by the complete segregation of favelas marked in green, orange, and yellow on the outskirts of the city, whereas city B um, exhibits more integration, but there are still pockets of segregation. And city C is a layout of complete integration. So I picked a city A and a city C, and I went there and spoke with the middle class. Recall that although Brasilia is the capital of Brazil, it has inferior solid waste collection compared to um, the city of Belo Horizonte. I now clarify that the two cities represent the extremes of segregation, 
So Brasilia is a city A, very segregated with a wealthy planned administrative urban center um, called the Plano Piloto and the poor neighborhoods on the urban periphery uh, called the Cidade Satelites. The poor neighborhoods outside of the Plano Piloto are so far apart that they're called cities, although they're neighborhoods. In contrast, Belo Horizonte is a city C, highly integrated with the favelas and corchizos peppered in between even the more affluent regions of the city. So I went and spoke with the middle-class neighborhood associations in both cities. And what I found was the concerns and objectives between the integrated and the segregated were quite different. So for the integrated um, middle-class in Belo Horizonte, focus groups were filled with incessant talk of crime. It was often about their fear of crime or about the uncollected trash or the con contaminated streams and rivers. In stark contrast, um, the middle class and segregated Brasilia were concerned with the encroachment of real estate interests, how the construction of high rise apartments that block the view from their houses um, you know, is so irritating and this essentially motivated the creation of their neighborhood association. In addition for the segregated, the provision of services such as private security um, sufficed so uh, the middle class in Brasilia were rather unsupportive of increasing the public provision of services. The integrated middle class in Belo Horizonte instead used private security, but it was common to hear the claim that it's not sufficient. Uh, private provision cannot substitute public patrolling at least. Last, the segregated in Brasilia had very limited opportunities for engaging with the poor. And it seems that as a result, they viewed the poor as the other. Their segregation made them rather oblivious to the deprivation of the poor satellite cities on the urban periphery. And it was very different in Belo Horizonte because the integrated middle class described these problems of uncollected sewerage and organized crime as problems within their community. To give a sense of why this all matters, when asked, are there, um, public services supported by both the middle class and the poor in the city and interviewed federal deputy of Brasilia, Erica Coque from the left-wing party, PSOL responded, I don't think so. And this is because they don't live in the same location. The cities, in other words, the neighborhoods here are either all rich, uh, sorry, all poor or all rich. There aren't mixed cities in the federal district. Brasilia is quite segregated overall. And even in the different cities within it, um, they're segregated. The middle class here, the rich here, they don't see the poor. And it's like the social problems are invisible and they wanna keep it this way. In contrast, in integrated Belo Horizonte, the problems of organized crime and contamination were not just problems of the poor, but rather the deprivation of, of the poor also affected the middle class. And they therefore have um, a self-interest in addressing these problems in uh, the, favel the favelas and comunidades because of the spillover effects. So now to more clearly state the hypotheses that draws on this qualitative evidence, I first make the assumption that uncollected sewerage and organized crime tends to be concentrated in poorer areas of the city because favelas and comunidades are deficient in public services. And this concentration of sewage and crime is often not spatially contained within the borders of these communities. The exact hypotheses or te I test are as follows. So a reduction in segregation of favelas from the rest of the urban population increases the neighboring middle class's exposure to these negative spatial effects. And this increased exposure to these negative spatial externalities of inequality in turn induces middle-class demand for externalities correcting public goods that largely benefit the poor. Yet increased exposure and increased contact with the poor directly decreases the perceived relative efficacy of private solutions to the externality problem. I take this argument a step further to argue that because the negative spatial externalities of inequality essentially binds the welfare of the middle class to that of the poor, making them interdependent, they also induce the middle class's vote for leftist pro-poor politicians in local elections. Politicians who are 
more likely to campaign on the public provision of services. So beyond the qualitative evidence from focus groups, I also more systematically test the hypotheses using large end data. The research design um, tests the spatial externalities mechanism against the main alternatives, the main alternatives being social affinity and racial tolerance. So spatial proximity to the poor can generate middle-class preferences for public goods because proximity increases social affinity towards the poor or because proximity enables racial tolerance. And these are conceptually different, uh, distinct mechanisms from the spatial externalities of inequality, which instead runs through a self-interest motive for reducing externality risks. So to test the spatial externalities mechanism against these alternatives, I do the following. So first I code measures of um, integration for each census area in Sao Paulo. And then second, I pair these measures with a, a proposed instrumental variable for integration at the census area level, which I'll discuss shortly. And then leveraging variation in integration across census areas, I collect a face-to-face -face survey of over 4,000 households across over 400 of the census areas. And in the middle of the survey, each respondent receives one randomized campaign platform vignette focusing on one of these three different mechanisms. And the vignettes serve two purposes. So first, I wanna measure these red arrows, instrumenting for respondents' geolocation. In other words, their integration experience. I estimate the causal effect of integration on respondents' endorsement of each of these campaign issues. I wanna know whether integration induces more or less fear of crime, more or less social affinity for the poor, and more or less racial tolerance. Second, the vignettes also serve a second purpose. I wanna measure these blue and red arrows together. So the vignettes are used unknowingly to the survey respondent as a randomized encouragement primer to evoke fear of crime, social affinity towards the poor, and racial tolerance before they receive a set of questions measuring their preferences and their vote choice. In other words, I'm interested in knowing how the effects of integration on preferences differs for someone who received a crime vignette as opposed to, for example, one about racial tolerance. And each of these three treatments are compared to a control, a, a control group, which is about general economic well-being in Sao Paulo. So a fourth group of um, survey respondents. And to be clear, while the effects of integration on the mechanisms, while uh, the red arrows could be positive or negative, the effects of the blue arrows are always in the positive direction. So respondents are always primed to think about an increase in fear of crime, an increase in social affinity, and an increase in racial tolerance always. But segregation could also decrease these uh, sentiments. So I code three different measures of segregation, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get into the technical details of um, how this is done. Happy to discuss more if there are questions later. And to measure preferences for public goods and for private provision, I'm grateful to my um, team of survey enumerators and um, field assistants because with their help, we were able to administer a face-to-face -face survey of 4,208 households and the survey covers 408 of the total 456 census areas in the city for Sao Paulo. And it largely targets the urban middle class defined as households making between one and five minimum wages. The map here on the right is um, one of Sao Paulo and it shows the geocoded survey observations across the census areas. So as discussed, the main difficulty with studying segregation or integration is the selection problem. Middle-class residents may self-sort into segregated or integrated neighborhoods by choice, in which case the integrated middle-class may be inherently more tolerant of the poor, whereas I'm interested in understanding how one's neighborhood context causally shapes one's perceptions and preferences. To address this, I propose an empirical strategy for estimating the effects of integration that is comprised of two parts. So first I construct a shift share um, instrument of predicted migration of the rural poor into each urban census area in Sao Paulo. 
For example, this figure maps the construction of the instrument predicted in migration into each Sao Paulo census area predicted for the 2000 to 2010 period. Second, I draw on the urban planning and design literature to construct a measure of urban form using the shape metrics package in ARC map GIS. So just to give a sense of what urban form means, these figures map a slice of different neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. And as you can see, urban form, the texture of each neighborhood varies considerably across neighborhoods. The predicted migration shift share component captures exogenous increases or decreases in the population of the poor within each census area. And alternatively, urban form is a static cross-sectional measure of the dispersion and circularity of each neighborhood. Urban form affects housing market prices and thus where in the city the poor can settle and the extent to which the middle class can sort in response to the in-migration of the poor. And um, the instrument, the final instrument, interacts these two components. So the first stage of the instrument is strong with an effect size of 0.3, which is considerable um, since the integration index only ranges from zero to one. And I estimate two stage least squares where in the first stage, I instrument for integration using the two interacted components and then in the second stage, we observe the effects of integration on the outcomes of interest. All models include uh, robust standard errors clustered at the area at the census area level. As for the exact outcomes, I'm focused on uh, to refresh. I first test the hypothesis that socioeconomic integration increases preferences for public goods that address the spatial externalities of inequality, yet it decreases relative preferences for private provision, namely private security. And it also increases um, the vote for the left in local level elections. So combining this uh, identification strategy proposed with the household survey, I estimate the effect of integration on preferences for different types of public goods. And the results show that um, Integration increases preferences for all types of externalities reducing public goods. For example, policing, street lights, and sewage collection. In contrast, it has no effect on preferences for public goods that do not address the spatial, the negative spatial effects, such as that of um, the provision of hospitals. I conducted this survey back in 2019, so a year ago, in a context without infectious diseases. So hospitals do not provide the function of reducing externalities. Today with COVID, it may be a different story. And while it increases preferences for externality goods, integration costly decreases relative preferences for private household provision of security. So I wanna clarify that I make a distinction between absolute and relative preferences for private security. And to measure relative preferences, I create a measure of the ratio of private and public preferences. So it's not the case that with integration, the middle class prefers less guns and fewer private guards. Instead, as the plot shows, with increasing integration, there's no effect on absolute demand for private security. The main point I wanna make is that it's all about how relative preferences for private provision relative to that for public provision decreases. So I next move on to examine the larger implication of, of these results regarding preferences on respondents vote choice at the polls. My hypothesis three claims that socioeconomic integration not only induces public goods demand, but also increases the middle class's support for pro poor left wing candidates in city level elections. And the logic behind this hypothesis is that preferences for private provision map onto support for the political right whereas um, that for public provision is correlated with support for the left. And to test this hypothesis, I create an aggregated Z-score index of preferences for public externality goods and slums, and also an index for private provision of services. So using these indices, it's clear that preferences for public externality goods in slums has this positive correlation with left-wing vote while that for private provision is uh, has a negative association. Thus, as a result, 
It does not come as a surprise that integration also induces the vote for left-wing candidates who I argue are more likely to promise the public provision of urban services in local elections. So models one and two here show the first stage effects of the instrument on two different measures of, of integration. In models three and four shows the corresponding second stage estimates. Next, as discussed, to understand why integration affects preferences for public goods and vote choice, I estimate the causal effect of integration on each of these mediating mechanisms. So I first use the mechanism vignettes as outcome measures to measure these red arrows. On uh, the graph here on the right shows the results using the endorsement campaigns as outcomes. So as the results show um, increased integration, in other words, more cross-class contact, increases fear of crime, but has um, a negative effect on social affinity towards the poor, and it has no effect on support for racial equality. As a robustness check, I also ask respondents directly about their fear of crime, their actual crime victimization, and I use preferences for soup kitchens as well as preferences for daycares in slums as a measure of social affinity. And the results on the left more or less mirror those on the right. So integration increases not only the psychological fear of crime, but also the actual incidence of crime victimization, victimization in the last 12 months. And concern for sewage is not significant. Um, but integration does decrease preferences for soup kitchens as well as that for daycares and slums. So increased contact does not generate uh, social affinity. In fact, it's the opposite, less affinity. This is important because it's not just the it's not it's not just that there's no effect, but rather there is a strong negative effect on affinity towards the poor. The effects of integration on racial tolerance are not significant. And overall, the results here illustrate um, that the effects of integration on preferences for public goods cannot be explained by respondents increased altruism towards the poor, nor their increased racial tolerance, but rather runs purely through a self-interest mechanism for reducing the risks of externalities. I now wanna put the red and blue arrows together by looking at the causal mediation effects of each of these mechanisms. So instead of as outcomes, I now use the mechanism campaign platforms as treatment vignettes. Once again, recall that the mechanism campaigns are testing a pro-encouragement of each, each of these mechanisms. So for example, although I just showed that integration decreases social affinity towards the poor, this is a pro affinity towards the poor encouragement. At the top in purple is the effect size for the full sample. And overall, integration has a positive effect as shown earlier on preferences for policing, as well as on that for um, left wing vote. And deconstructing this effect for the full sample, we can see that the effect size uh, varies according to the mechani mechanisms respondents are primed to consider. So for the subset of respondents who received a, the crime vignette, the effect size of integration on preferences for policing is even larger. And for those primes to think about race, the effect size is slightly less than that for the full sample. For social affinity, it's still positive, but it's not significant. Looking now at a left-wing vote as an outcome, for the subset of respondents in the social affinity treatment, the effect size is slightly larger than that for the full sample, which makes sense because the vignette primes respondents to think about lower life expectancy in favelas and preaches about how where there's a need, there should be generous desires to help. However, the effect size for the subset of respondents in the crime treatment is even larger. So being primed to think about the spillovers in crime from favelas has the largest effect on vote for leftist candidates and the results for um, the race vignette is not significant. This set of results to me show that the spatial externalities effect is a much stronger mechanism or at least has a uh, much larger mediation effect than the alternative mechanisms proposed in the literature. So to summarize, I find that socioeconomic integration causally increases preferences for certain types of public goods, such as 
policing and sewage collection, yet it decreases pref uh, relative preferences for private alternatives. Preferences for the public map one to support for the left in local elections. And overall, this positive effect on preferences for public goods cannot be explained by a social affinity nor a racial tolerance effect from contact as just discussed, but rather runs purely through this self-interest mechanism for reducing externality risks. The findings have major implications for the, the distributed politics literature because private solutions are sufficient in a segregated context, segregation limits the need for the publicness of urban goods and services. In contrast, integration shifts preferences for, uh, for private club goods that are only accessible to those well off to um, that for public provision that also benefits the poor. In increasing the valuation of public externality goods, Integration also induces the middle class to swing left, thus reducing political polarization along class lines in city level politics. And the spatial externalities mechanism is important because it means that the effects of class may cross cut those of race. When class overlays race, the spatial externalities mechanism can potentially offset the negative effect of racial diversity on collective demand for public goods. So last, as I mentioned, this paper is part of a larger book project and in alternative chapters, I first parse out the overlapping and cross-cutting effects of class and of race-based segregation using a set of conjoint survey experiments also conducted face-to-face -face across census areas. And second, I consider redistributive social spending. So reducing externalities by reducing inequality directly as an alternative to public goods as a solution to the externalities problem. Third, although the core focus of um, my um, project is on the consequences of segregation, I also have a chapter on its political origins and, exam and it examines the causes of segregation during three different historical periods. I'd be happy to discuss this further if it's of interest. And finally, a fourth chapter examines the conditions under which voters' preferences in cities map onto actual public goods outcomes. Okay, last, I just wanted to say that this project wouldn't have been feasible without the support um, of my excellent field assistants in survey enumerate, enumerators. Their names are on my website. And also um, I thank FJV CPSV for all their support, especially for the community and for all their help with applying for the ethics review for the study. Um, and also to USP SEM for all their incredible data and the great feedback and advice, the support of the Harvard Brazil office, funding from the Lehman Foundation, Dr. Class and other sources, and overall the generosity of so many um, in Brazil from like fellow academics to residents of these neighborhoods with their time um, in having these like priceless conversations with me about what's going on on the ground. So yeah, I'm very grateful. I'll leave things at there, but if you have any questions or suggestions, I'd be happy to discuss this project further. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alice. And now um, let's hear from our discussants, Danny. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is wonderful to see this develop. I sort of seen your interest in you know urban um, form and interaction with political preferences for a while, and uh, it's it's amazing to see what what's what's come out of it. And particularly the survey, I just think the survey is amazing. Um, in fact, you know, I I sort of real I guess this will be for the book, but part of me really wanted to see much more about the description, descriptive kind of basic description statistics to see variation with within the middle class and within sort of ideological buckets within the middle class on these pre pre finer green preferences for different kinds of political um, public goods. But I, you know, I assume that's more for the book, but I, I guess I, like, I wanna read that. <laughs> um, so I have, I have a bunch of comments on the sort of the empirical design, the research design, which you sort of flagged in the, in the paper you sent. So, um, and you know, I have a lot more in my written comments that I'll send you. But so let me. But before I get to those, I just want to say uh, one have one uh, sort of comment. It's more of a question, um, it, it just uh, that I'd love to see fleshed out about the mapping between kind of political preferences or policy preferences and sort of vote for the left. 
which um, you know seems like a core part of the paper. So uh, I love the focus on policy preferences, and I totally agree with you that you need to focus on preferences because so there's so many intervening variables between supply of public goods and and preferences. So that is like a, a really big contribution of this of this uh, of of this work. The mapping between policy preference and left wing ideology, like left wing ideology or left wing vote, I guess, to be more particular specific, is a little bit less clear to me, just because I, you know, I I just think that the way the ideology uh, works in the city can be, um, it just does not work the same way as it does nationally, or at least it doesn't need to. And just just you know, to think about like Cambridge, where you know, uh, uh, Biden got ninety percent of the vote, something like that. Um, there, are, but when you actually look at like Cambridge level politics. There are really clear distinctions within the left on thinking about local provision of public goods. And in your the paper, you sort of have this index of voting for the left, which I, you know, it wasn't entirely yeah, I, I couldn't find exactly how that was constructed. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I can imagine how it was constructed. And, and I just think there's probably gonna be like very quite quite you know fine-grained distinctions within the left, which maybe not aware uh, uh, visible to the voters, but I think very much could be. You know, like, for example, you know, there's an election this Sunday, I think. I haven't been following it very closely, but, like, my impression is that, you know, Dato versus Bolus, you know, the PT yeah. versus the PISOL, it's, like, very distinct kinds of left, you yeah. know, and I, I, I don't know. I, I'd be interested in if there's any kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe um, uh, people who live in Sao Paulo could, could tell me here is that there are, like, there are policy platforms with regard to these kind of spatial externalities can be quite distinct and maybe people could pick up on that. And so this mapping again between preferences and the left, I think is like, it's not necessarily unproblematic, it's problematic, especially when you're in a context where, uh, you know, things like nimbyism and all those kinds of things that, ha that, that create cleavages within the left when thinking about sort of, you know, urban policy exists. So, it, you know, this is something like, I just think there's a lot, a, a lot to be mined there. And I would love to see that develop. Maybe not doesn't that necessarily have to be in the paper itself, but like, more broadly, so um, so that's, that's just one thing that I, I, uh, I that that that, that caught my um, attention. Okay, so in terms of the research design, um, I, I I think there's a lot to like here, but sometimes it's a little bit just difficult to track what exactly what comparisons are 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 being made. So you know the instrument you're basically using these push factors like the you know you know droughts and land reform or or just like bean you know maize or whatever uh, yeah. in these far off northeastern municipalities. They they are like differentially shocking these northeastern municipalities and sending. Um, and sending migrants to Sao Paulo to different neighborhoods, um, and so that's creating this exogenous, very you know, uh, variation. Okay, so that's that's great, and that's understandable in the sense that you get like this that creates this cross-sectional variation in who in levels of the poor, and then potentially also the spatial spatial um, segregation. Because and so you interact it with this this um, uh, I forgot what you call it, but this basically this the uh, you know urban this form. urban form, yeah. yeah. Um, so. So I guess the one, one, one thing that wasn't clear to me, and I think it could be developed in the paper, um, is so when you have like high values of this instrument, you're basically comparing places that essentially have had more poverty, probably because they're getting receiving these migrants and have uh, more, uh, you know, or less or more segregated, depending on the direction of, I guess, uh, uh, less segregated, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, you know, poor compared to places that are both uh, have less poor and are uh, uh, more more segregated. I guess it, it, you have this two-dimensional instrument, and uh, at the high values. It's, I understand what's happening, but then when you're comparing your places with low values, it's, it could be or you know middle values. It could be either places that are like less poor or also uh, I guess more segregated. Um, yeah. And so so like that that comparison is a little bit hard to think about because you're not you know it's not like you're holding poverty fixed and then varying segregation. At least I don't think you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that it, it makes it a little bit hard to think about. And then, and then it's just not clear to me that like, I, I, I'm never sure if it's like, what, what's doing the work here, poverty or segregation. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I think both I'm sure are, are, are playing a role here, but I, you know, your theoretical story is much more on, on the, on sort of these, the segregation. Um, mm -hmm. So, so like clarifying that would be, would be, uh, would be helpful. And, and here, I think, I, I just don't know, may, maybe you have a good answer to this, but like, why not just think, like think about the interaction between the dispersion index and the and the predicted migration and then just look at the differential effects of predicted migration as you vary spatial form and looking at those two, um, you know, like to, you know, just looking at the interaction directly as opposed to kind of combining them uh, as, as the way you do. Um, 
Wait, wait. So um, can I just really ask about this? Um, sure. So like interact the two components of the instrument. Well, include the main effects and the interactions and then just look at, you know, yeah. like we usually do with interact interaction terms. In, in, right. in so I do include the main effects with the interactions. Oh, okay. So I guess exploring that, like showing that to me, okay. like I'd be very okay. interested to see like what happens as poverty is increasing and then okay. also, okay. but but like not, you know, but, but uh, you know, with low levels of, of or high values of segregation, you know, just okay. essentially just showing the, the, the four by four quadrant, the, you know, two by two quadrants. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then, and then finally, let me uh, add up because I, I, I know there's a lot of people here. I don't want to dominate any time and I'll send you my comments. The, the, the other part of the design that I'm worried about is just the spatial correlations, which I know you're aware of, um, mm -hmm. but I'm still worried about it just because I look at the map and I see, you know, and it's just, w w of course, we just know this about the world is that like migrants from similar regions, municipalities are going to tend to migrate to similar parts of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it looks to me like just from eyeballing the maps that like you see these strong within Sao Paulo correlations. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously like voting trends and uh, policy preferences also could be uh, are, 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 are strongly correlated. And, and you, you mentioned like you have some kind of placebo test in there, but it, I, you know, I just didn't quite understand it. I'm not familiar with the references you say in there. And so I, I, I either help me understand the placebo test or, okay. uh, or, or the, do something like you need to generate like artificial dependent variables with the same spatial trend and correlation structure as ideology and um, as ideology and show to me that that's not, you know, um, that that's that, that that you're not getting like these kind of spurious, spurious resorts, or maybe more fine-grained geographic control. So flexibly controlling for longitude and latitude. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I didn't see that. Maybe it's in there. I'm not sure. Um, or th things like that, because I just really worry about uh, uh, you know just the classic problems with spatial, you know, spatial correlations kind of leading to mm -hmm. um, standard errors that are too small. Um, you but you oh. then clustering the standard errors in spatially in some way. Like beyond just like at the yeah, you can you can cluster at higher levels. I think uh, okay. you know that's pos possible. Uh, you know, one one paper I really recommend is there's this paper called um, the standard errors of persistence, um, which is it's 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 um it's not about uh it's it's about a sort of different substantive domain, but it's highly relevant to what you're doing here by Morgan Kelly. He's a econ okay. economic historian, and uh, anyways, I strongly recommend that paper. Um, and so, but. You know, again, like I generally think the data is amazing. I like I'm, you know, the, the mechanism makes a lot of sense to me, uh, um, and so I think just you know fine tuning and nailing down these parts of the empirical design, and then like I would love to see sort of a more fine grain, more substantively tuned unpacking what the left is. Like mm -hmm. I would would really make this a home run for me. Um, so uh, so congratulations, and uh, can't wait to see the whole the whole book. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Danny. Fantastic comments. And since I'm not capable of providing them, thank you. Um, no, no, no. And now continuing right along, Jonathan has accompanied Alice's project for some time. So we're really eager to hear your comments on, on her paper for today. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. And yeah, thank you so much for the invite, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Alice, so happy to see this in uh, such an incredible, astonishing uh, detail. There's so much here to, to do that I, I'm, someone's clearly been using the lockdown very productively, <laughs> which is good to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I'll, I'll skip the, the praise and, and, the, and what's being done right here, just because I think that's clear and focus on some constructive suggestions, which again, I'll have to skim because of the time, but I think uh, I'll send those by, by email as well. Okay, first point. Um, so I did want to interrogate a little bit more this question, this assumption really that the externalities are greater in the poorer neighborhoods. Um, I think that's defensible and I think there's like lots that can be, be provided to, to empirically demonstrate that, but it isn't here. And I'm a little bit concerned that it comes across a little bit as, as a normative assumption. And, and I know that's not the case, but um, there is some evidence. And, and I was thinking really here about Beatrice Magaloni's work in Rio, for example, on crime. Um, mm -hmm. that yes, it's true that in the poorest neighborhoods, the police you know, do a lot of killings, actually the, the sort of civilian homicides are taking place more in the middle-class neighborhoods. Uh, and so I think there's a question here about whether processes of gentrification and, and things which actually accumulate wealth can actually be triggers for some of these externalities as well. Uh, and so I think there's a question to be, to be had about how generalizable that assumption is. Um, similarly, you know, the crime, for example, may depend not just on the poor, but on the interaction between poor and rich neighborhoods, right? Because the sort of the opportunity cost and the opportunities for crime um, both come into the equation. So I think there's a little bit more work you could do that to just convince us that um, these externalities really are um, 
really follow the patterns that you suggest. And I think you do have data for that, um, but it's not, it's not here and it's not at the level I think that we need. It's at the sort of the neighborhood integration or segregation level, not at the, the poor versus rich um, micro data. Um, but I think that's, that's doable and I think that will really help the, the depth of the argument. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the, the sort of the logic for why these relative public goods um, preferences emerge in more integrated neighborhoods, um, I think that's a tr it's, 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 it's clear in the paper and it's convincing, but I think it's hard because different goods have such different profiles, right? And you cite two goods, which I think can potentially be very different. So um, if we think about before any solutions have been put in place, I would imagine that sort of garbage and sewage is increasing as the wealth of a neighborhood increases, right? So I produce a huge amount of, of rubbish in my apartment um, because I'm relatively well off here, right? And, and that's not like that gets taken away by the private or public solutions, but the raw amount of externality that I could be producing here is quite large, right? So the income profile, the income effect of um, uh, on my garbage production is quite is quite positive. Mm -hmm. um, in contrast, maybe for crime that goes in a potentially different direction. Um, again, I think empirically we want to question that, but um, sort of again the assumption that those public uh, goods preferences emerge automatically um, is not obvious to me, right? It may be that rich neighborhoods still support public goods provision for purely efficiency reasons, right? Like well, we do have excellent garbage collection in middle-class neighborhoods because uh, uh, it makes sense to do that, right? From a pure efficiency standpoint, not from an, uh, a spillover from the poor standpoint. And so I was a little bit, not concerned, I guess, but just it would be useful to lay out how these different goods might have different profiles of, um, of spillovers and, and how that changes at different levels of income uh, and the implications of that for your argument. Um, Third, I would say, um, I think similar to some of the other comments you've probably received is that there's a, there's a question of scale here still. And obviously in the, in the dissertation, you want to analyze things both at the city level and at the, um, and at the sort of the local, the census area level. Um, but it strikes me that the, the specific externalities spillovers that you're treating probably have a particular sort of geographical range. Like you talk about the sound of a gunshot in one moment, right? Or the stench of, of garbage, right? And those spillovers are probably quite localized uh, in their nature. And so I think from a purely theoretical point of view, obviously we have different levels of segregation at different hierarchies of scale in the city. Um, and there, there may be a sort of theory driven way of picking out what is the appropriate neighborhood to analyze. Here, it, like mostly you're sort of working with these census areas, which are pretty arbitrary, right? Like they're not really based on any political or administrative basis, right? Um, so I worry a little bit that like, um, how do we know this is the right scale to be looking at, right? Um, so yeah. In particular, it may be useful um, to sort of construct some more sort of theory informed distances to weight or smooth these, these data out a little bit um, to, mm -hmm. to work out what's going on. Um, and again, related to that, there's sort of a, a supply side question, right? Which is, okay, yes, people demand more public goods perhaps, but who can supply those? Is it reasonable that your local councillor or mayor could actually supply that? And in the example of Brasilia, it might not be, right? Because a lot of these satellite cities are in an entirely different state, they're in Goiás, so you can't really demand that public goods response from your own representative. Um, it has to go to a higher, higher level, right? Which is much, much more complicated. Um, so I think, again, just working out the sort of the spatial overlaps between these scales is, is important. Mm -hmm. Related to that, um, the question of the urban form instrument, I, I must confess, I didn't understand the full details of, uh, of this, but it makes sense. Um, I worry that it makes more sense at the city level than it does at the census area level. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure how it was being applied. So is the question, is, is the measure, for example, of um, this area of the census uh, data collection effort is more compact and circular than another one, right? Um, I, I, if that's the case, and the implication is that that's going to affect, for example, the, the, the concentration of, of rents and, and uh, land value in the center of that uh, unit, then I think it's quite a different case to apply it at the sub-city level where we know that there are neighboring census areas which will also presumably have similar dynamics occurring. So mm -hmm. the implication, for example, that if we have two very compact neighborhoods next to each other, that both are going to be pushing the poor out to their periphery would suggest that sort of uh, the census areas that are neighbors are going to have uh, poor, poor neighborhoods next to each other on their, on their border. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if that was the implication or how this was being used, but um, I think it would be good to clarify that. Um, in particular, because there's no real borders or boundaries between um, between these areas, right? They're sort of completely arbitrary. Um, not completely arbitrary, but you know, they can be arbitrary. Um, 
So I was wondering, you know, again, I can send more specific suggestions, but things like using actual zoning areas, which are quite common in Sao Paulo, right? That you can build high rise buildings here, you can't here. And that creates some quite sharp distinctions and maybe define neighborhoods where actually you do get these differences in uh, the ability to relocate or the pressures on the poor. Mm -hmm. A combination of those two last points, I think, is that the way that you're geocoding the data from the survey is that you're putting people directly in the census area, the segregation value of the census area in which their address falls, right? And if they're near a boundary, I worry again that there might be some, uh, that's a very abrupt sort of cliff edge, right? Like if I'm, so for example, my road is actually the, the boundary of one uh, census area, right? So if I live on one side of, of my road, I have a higher value of segregation than on the other side of the road. Um, and my lived experience is obviously not very different based on my actual address. And so that sort of cliff edge difference in segregation values Again, this is all measurement error probably, right? And probably doesn't affect your results, but I think I would be more convinced and it would make more sense to me to see a map where segregation varies relatively smoothly, which reflects sort of, you know, the fact that I, I move around in my local environment and interact with um, a, a relatively smooth interaction with the local population. So again, if there's a way to smooth these measures, I think that might help make it a little bit more realistic, um, but I don't expect that would change the results, of course. Mm -hmm. I do I don't have to for um, distance from boundaries. I don't know if that matters, but like, yeah, I um, I guess you're saying like smooth it even at the edges, like for these indices, that would be. Yeah, just calculate some smooth measure of this segregation index and attribute yeah. that to the census, uh, to the survey responses and see if it makes a difference just as a robustness check. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have too much time, more time, so I'll be quick, but I think on the instrument, um, I think I, I agree. I think with Danny that the sort of the intuition for even this first stage effect to me wasn't super intuitive. I actually thought that, you know, this, this uh, shock of having more poor migrants might increase uh, segregation rather than reduce it was my sort of initial intuition. And so I think just explaining that and working the reader through that logic would really help. Um, Cause I'm kind of trying to think, you know, do they have to be more poor than the people they're joining? Where are they gonna be inside that census area, et cetera? Um, and I, I trust you completely, but I think it just needs to be laid out a bit more clearly. I would also suggest selling this instrument a bit more, right? It's very often that we see instruments which are using a very small and bizarre portion of the variation in our treatment variable, but it strikes me that this is likely to explain a large proportion of what's going on in treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. And so again, that makes your generalizability and the claims that you're making much more credible and uh, valuable. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's more that you could do to sell it. One sort of concern that I think you try and address in one of the appendices, but it wasn't 100% convincing to me, um, was distinguishing segregation from inequality. Um, and uh, I think that's tricky, but I think there's a theoretical reason to do that, not just an empirical one. Um, so Katrina Kosek has this really cool paper where she looks at public goods which have private substitutes and those that don't have private substitutes, mm -hmm. right? And she argues that there's a big difference in how um, demands for, for, uh, from the middle class, from the rich change when they're able to substitute out of, uh, for example, education and healthcare, but not out of security, maybe. Mm -hmm. This sounds pretty similar to your argument. It's different, but it's, a, it's that they map on quite similarly to the categories that you're talking about. So I can see, for example, healthcare being a private substitute public, you know, uh, good, um, yeah. potentially private substitute, whereas street lighting is not. Um, similar to the sort of externality goods that you're talking about. And so I think distinguishing your argument from hers and showing that yours is the one really driving things here would be a huge contribution. Uh, and so I think just working through what would this look like for inequality, does it give you the same results or different results would be, would be great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, um, do I have time to make two more quick points, Fran? Or? Yes. I do, okay, I'll be very quick. So firstly, I would say, um, depending on the audience, depending on who you're communicating with, it's not immediately obvious to me how your story maps onto the history of Sao Paulo, right? The instrument is a little bit abstract. It covers different points in time. And trying to relate that to sort of the, the, the current experience of migration, segregation, and public goods provision in Sao Paulo requires um, uh, a lot more detail. And that's not necessary for making the sort of the, the theoretical argument, but I think it'd be really cool if uh, alternative papers or for the book project, you could actually delve historically, uh, or recent history at least, uh, and look at what's happening with this migration, with this segregation, where it's changing uh, and how it's playing out in practice. And your survey gives you a great starting point for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in particular, you know, 
the, sort of the most obvious sort of changes that I, I can think of in the city is the sort of the abandonment of the central area and then the re sort of gentrification of that area more recently. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely clear to me how much of that is being driven by migration and how much is being driven by middle, middle class flight out of those areas and, and repopulation, right? Yeah. I don't know, but I think it would be really interesting if you can either use that as an example or pick another part of the city and another historical process which really illustrates exactly what's going on to put some more meat on sort of the argument here and make it more intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, can, we can talk more about that. Um, and finally, um, and just one of the things, so I think, you know, you can generalize the argument you have here from your survey data, for example, on the left and right, by using sort of geocoded voting data from the whole city, right, including these coming elections. You don't need to stick to your survey for that. So that can give you a lot more power and a lot more insight. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, very quickly, so you talk about this, um, this sort of fear of externalities mechanism, right, and, and, and this makes... Uh, makes a very, very strong argument about causal mediation, which I really, really, really enjoyed. I did just want to sort of understand a little bit more that this, is this something you still expect to arise in equilibrium after these more integrated neighborhoods have demanded public goods and therefore presumably had some effect on reducing the incidence of these externalities, right? Um, you're not seeing these neighborhoods before they've solved these problems. You're seeing them in the process of maybe solving them, right? And so it may be in some cases that we, we don't see fear of crime because um, integrated neighborhoods have already solved these problems by having effective policing. Um, and, and again, you talk about this in the appendix and it's, it's, it's related, but it's not 100% convincing, I don't think, mm -hmm. um, in the way that you use the survey questions to, to separate this sort of fear of the unknown versus fear of actual crime experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so again, happy to talk more about that, but I think just telling us a little bit more how you're interpreting this and, and what we should read into it would would make what is an incredible empirical analysis something that we can really sort of just relate to more more intuitively. Um, I'll stop that because I've talked talk too much, but this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you both so much. Your comments were fantastic. Um, Ellis, if it's OK, what I'd like to do is ask a couple of questions from our audience mm -hmm. and then give you an opportunity to address either Danny and Johnny or, but, but please answer the questions from the audience, but also you can wrap up as well. Um, so we have a question from Paula Rietel. I hope I've pronounced your name right. Um, she's picking up on your comments about voting for the left. And she finds it surprising um, what you found about voting for the left because the left does not talk at all about public security. It's the right that talks about security. Um, they talk about increasing the presence of police in middle-class neighborhoods. So she's curious about why people in integrated neighborhoods would vote more often for the left when it's the right who are telling them they'll put more police there. Um, that mm -hmm. strikes me as a very important question. She um, also asks um, how you, to explain a bit if there's time um, how you can how you constructed the shift share instrument? Um, I think you you intrigued a lot of people with your instrument. Um, and Jonathan just told us that if you sell it right, it'll be a huge contribution. Um, so people are a little interested in um, how you constructed it. Mm -hmm. And we have a question also from Daniel McDonald, who, by the way, is at Harvard this year. He's at the Mahindra um, Humanities Center, if you'd like to talk to him. So um, he is interested in your um, assertion that income tra trumps race as a political cleavage. Mm -hmm. And he wants to know how one necessarily excludes the other in shaping preferences for public goods, given how racialized class differences are between the two, especially in urban contexts. So if you can address those questions. Um, sorry, I've got one more. And since I don't think we're gonna come back to me, I'm gonna put a third question out. This is from Ben Bradlow. And he um, is also at Harvard this year. And he is wondering about how perceptions of state capacity affect demand for public goods and preferences for private goods. Um, so even though you're, even though you are focusing on cities that meet some objective standards of fiscal capacity, you're not in some yeah. tiny municipality of 5,000 people, it doesn't have anything still. How do people take into account what they think 
um, the capacity of, of uh, state municipal government will be to provide public goods in the formation of their preferences? Those are excellent questions. Yeah. And uh, I will leave this to, to uh, I'll give you. Okay, um, thanks for these fantastic questions. I guess I should, uh, I guess I'll address the questions first, um, but also, you know, thanks to Danny and also to Johnny for the amazing <laughs> comments that I got today. Um, but I guess I'll first speak, speak to these questions. Um, so first for Paula's uh, question about comments for voting for the left and how you find surprising because, um, you know, I'm focused pretty largely on public security and the left does not talk about public security. Um, and then also more about the shift share instrument. So um, I'm actually, I'm really thankful that you asked this question because I've been thinking a lot about this topic and I'm actually not sure about how I'm thinking about this. And, and I'm curious to know um, what the audience, especially like Brazilians think about this. Um, I've been trying to ask a lot of Braz Brazilians about how they think about this problem but I'm still really unsure about how um, I would think about this question. So I, I think that um, there's inherently a difference between the segregated versus the integrated middle class. So I think there um, is high fear of crime all over cities, all parts of cities, integrated, segregated, everyone has fear of crime even the very segregated middle and upper class in Brazil have high fear of crime. But I think that there's like a difference between innate sensitivity to fear of crime and um, you know, statistics about crime, what you hear about talk of crime from word of mouth versus like the actual experience of um, being a victim of crime and, and experiencing crime directly within your neighborhood. I think there's like a difference between innate fear of crime and sensitivity to crime. Um, because I think that even um, among the most segregated, so um, as is the case with in, in the US, even um, the most like segregated, very homogeneously white areas of the US, xenophobia is quite high among those areas. So I would expect that um, also like from, you know, these focus groups that the very segregated middle and upper class in Brazil have high fear of crime. But um, it's one thing to be very afraid of crime, but to never have experienced crime versus like to be someone living in these very integrated contexts and to have like actually experienced being robbed in the streets. And I think the difference is that um, when you have high fear of crime, you think that by buying more guns and you know investing in these private security is, private security measures is probably sufficient. Whereas if you've actually experienced crime and seen how things work in these integrated neighborhoods, you know that um, there's just like no way. You know that there needs to be some large scale effort. You need. You know that there needs to be like investment on the part of like um, the state secretary for public security or or whatnot. You know there needs to be more public, top down solutions um, that addresses the, these problems more holistically across all these areas. And um, for those reasons, I found that the the people who have actually experienced crime, they actually seem to be more left leaning. I'm curious to know what, you know, the audience, I guess, is, especially Paula, since you, you've asked this question, what you think of this response, because I've been thinking a lot about this, like what is the difference between different types of fear of crime versus uh, in the segregated versus integrated neighborhoods or the middle class? About the actual shift share instrument. So I have um, a lot on this. I can share my screen, but I guess I could, I could just talk about this. Um, basically there are two components to the shift share instrument in itself. So there are the shifts, which um, is about predicting migration in this current period. In this current period being from like 2000 to 2010, what accounts for the predictive migration of the rural poor in this current period. And I look at a, a series of um, push factors such as uh, drought, um, uh, changes in land inequality, land reforms, 
uh, genetically modified soy, genetically modified corn and other types of crops, um, just changes in rural dynamics that could result in the push of out migrants of the rural poor from rural municipalities into urban census areas in some follow. And in addition to these shifts, I interact the shifts with um, the polls, which is the um, historical pull factors. So looking at historical settlement patterns of rural migrants from the very same communities as the current migrants in the current period. But um, for certain other historical reasons, they migrated for different reasons. So the idea is that um, the current uh, predicted migration for the current period is exogenous to the um, historical migration patterns of uh, people from the same communities. So that, that's like the general idea for the um, shift share instrument for predicted, predicted migration. Um, but I could elaborate on this further if there is interest. Also for um, Daniel McDonald's question about how, you know, income trumps race as a political cleavage. Um, how does one necessarily exclude the other given the racialized differences in urban contexts? So um, I think the bulk of the literature on segregation is about the US or about Sub-Saharan Africa. And in those contexts, it's always about race. It's always about how racial segregation matters in some way in the US or ethnic segregation matters in the Sub-Saharan African context. I really think that for the Latin American context, especially for Brazil, it's much, it's much more so about class. And I'm not saying that Brazil is less racially or ethnically diverse. Brazil is actually more racially diverse according to various indices. For example, um, from the Elisina et al. paper from 2002, they, ask, they actually classify Brazil as being more racially and ethnically diverse than the United States. And you know, overall having a Brazilian passport on the black market, that's like the most expensive passport you can have because any one of us could be Brazilian just from the way we look. Um, it's, it's the most expensive passport because there's so much racial and ethnic diversity in Brazil. Um, but the point is that politically, it seems like the most important sociopolitical cleavage is about class. And even though race overlays class, it's very much about these socio sociopolitical cleavages. And that's why I'm focused on um, socioeconomic segregation and, and how this matters. In other chapters of the dissertation, I do address the difference between class versus um, race-based segregation. Um, I look at a set of survey, uh, conjoint survey experiments to separate the effects of class and of race across space. But um, I do think class is the most important dominant cleavage in Brazil. Uh, for Ben's question about how perceptions of state capacity affects demand for public, public and private goods. Um, I guess I haven't thought a lot about this because I've more or less held state capacity constant since um, I've, I've looked at mostly these large cities, which I assume has like comparable levels of fiscal capacity. But I would expect that um, you know, it's especially given that there's like high state capacity, given that I'm focused on these contexts of high state capacity, it is still shocking that you don't see as much evenness in the provision of infrastructural public goods. In fact, sometimes in these uh, contexts of, of high fiscal capacity, you even see more spatial inequality in the provision of public goods, which is quite puzzling. If the state has such high capacity, why can't they get their act together and provide more evenly? So, I mean, that's that's been like the puzzle that I've been focused on. So it's it's not as much about variation in state capacity, but even looking at these high capacity contexts, why um, is there so much inequality spatially? Okay, I'm done. Okay, perfect. Okay. I know that Alice wanted to say more and address um, our discussants' comments. 
but we have unfortunately, very unfortunately, come to the end of our time. I want to say more than a perfunctory thank you to everybody here who participated and everyone who attended the session today. Um, Alice, at the end of her, um, before she, the end of her presentation, um, said her thanks um, to the people who helped to fund her, the people who carried out the field work for her in these 400 census tracts of the city of Sao Paulo. Um, and this was amazing research, by the way, but she also thanked the people who had conversations with her. And I just was warmed by the things that she said, because I've tried over these years to create a community in which fantastic research can go on about Brazil and that we can foster collaborations between our researchers at Harvard, faculty, graduate students, undergraduates, visitors, and to our colleagues in Brazil, to our graduate students in Brazil, to our faculty colleagues, to our undergraduates in Brazil, and to the many think tanks um, and NGOs in Brazil. So this to me is just a remarkable reaffirmation of all the great work that we've been able to do, sharing our knowledge, our methods, our skills. Um, and so I wanna thank um, everyone who attended did. I want to especially thank Danny and Jonathan and Alice. Amazing. Thank you very, very much to everybody.